I want to read you a very shocking story which Jesus told. It's found in Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20, we're going to read the first 16 verses. The kingdom of heaven is like this. Once there was a man who went out early in the morning to hire some men to work in his vineyard. He agreed to pay them the regular wage, a silver coin a day, and sent them to work in his vineyard. He went out again to the marketplace at nine o'clock and saw some men standing there doing nothing. So he told them, you also go and work in the vineyard and I will pay you a fair wage. So they went. Then at twelve o'clock and again at three o'clock he did the same thing. It was nearly five o'clock when he went to the marketplace and saw some other men still standing there. Why are you wasting the whole day here doing nothing, he asked them. No one hired us, they answered. Well then, you also go and work in the vineyard, he told them. When evening came, the owner told his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, starting with those who were hired last and ending with those who were hired first. The men who had begun to work at five o'clock were paid a silver coin each. So when the men who were the first to be hired came to be paid, they thought they would get more. But they too were given a silver coin each. They took their money and started grumbling against the employer. These men who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, while we put up with our whole day's work in the hot sun. Yet you paid them the same as you paid us. Listen, friend, the owner answered one of them. I have not cheated you. After all, you agreed to do a day's work for one silver coin. Now take your pay and go home. I want to give this man who was hired last as much as I've given you. Don't I have the right to do as I wish with my own money? Or are you jealous? because I am generous. And Jesus concluded, so those who are last will be first, and those who are first will be last. It's shocking, isn't it? We're going to talk about it in a moment. It has not been a very happy new year. We wish that to each other on January the 1st, and here we are, short of food and fuel, with escalating strikes. The train and the truck drivers this week are going to hold us all to ransom. And there's the possibility of a national state of emergency. And we are in a mess. And behind it all, there is a scramble for wages now that the pay restraint seems to have been a failure. And nobody wants to be the first to have to tighten their belt and those with might are seeking to get a rise as quickly as possible. The results are pretty grim. If they manage to get an average of 12% rise, which looks a possibility, then inflation is certainly back into double figures this year and 200,000 people now at work will lose their jobs. If, as some are asking for 40%, if they settled finally for around 25%, then inflation would be greater than 25% and half a million more would be out of work in this country, bringing the total of unemployed fairly near 2 million. And as I read all this in the papers and listened to it on the news, I found myself asking, is there any pa passage in the Bible which we ought to be looking at in this situation? Is there anything that Christians need to be hearing? And I found myself reading this incredible story about work and wages in Matthew chapter 20. And I felt that hidden within it there is a very strong word from the Lord to us as we talk about the situation, as we maybe find ourselves involved if we belong to one of the unions concerned. And as I looked at this story of Jesus, I thought, what an incredible story. I'd love to present it to, say, Mr. Wedgwood Ben, um, or Mr. Michael Foote, or I would like to ask one of the trade union secretaries to expound it, perhaps uh, Ray Buckton or Moss Evans of the Transport and General Workers Union, 
and possibly then ask the chairman of the CBI to interpret it for us and finally to ask one of the Tory spokesmen to give his comments. And as I imagined what each of them would say, I realized that each of them would fasten on part of the story and say there is biblical justification for our political stance. It proves again that you can prove anything from the Bible if you take parts of it. But as I tried to listen, for example, to a fairly extreme left-wing socialist, I would hear him say, well, I'm glad to see that the owner called him comrade. Because, <laughs> in fact, that is the exact Greek word used at the end of the story. But I think the left-wing socialist would also say, now here are the two basic rights for which we are fighting. First of all, the right to work. Here was an owner creating jobs for the unemployed. That is part of our political platform. And the other thing that he would latch on to would be the principle that a man deserves a full living wage even if he can't get work. And if a man can only work one hour out of twelve or one month in twelve, he ought to be paid the same as a man who's been able to get work for the whole time. And so that would be the socialist saying, there it is, that story supports the socialist platform. By the way, that's not imagination because Lord Soper preached exactly what I've just said at the Trade Union Congress in Brighton some years ago. Now, I would listen next, I think, perhaps to a shop steward leading an unofficial strike, and I can hear him identifying straight away with that man who came and spoke on behalf of the workers and said, here, what's happened to wage differential? And why aren't wages being related to the shift hours and the conditions of work? And remember, we worked in the heat of the day, and they worked in cooler conditions. Now, come on, we've got to sit down and talk this through. And I can imagine the Tory spokesman looking at this parable and saying, great, no trade unions involved, <laughs> no civil servants breathing down the owner's neck, the laissez-faire conditions, you can allow supply and demand of work and laborers, the boss is free to decide on the wages, he makes the decisions, he carries the responsibility, that's exactly what we stand for in the Conservative Party. And so all of them, we must have one member of the party present. <laughs> now all of these people, and I could go on like this, all of them are picking out parts of the parable. But if you asked each of them, what do you think about the whole story, I think every one of them would say it wouldn't work. It is idealistic, it's impracticable, and in fact, it would be bad personnel management. It's a recipe for disaster. If you tried to apply the whole of that story to our economic situation today, we'd be over the precipice tomorrow. Indeed, trying to imagine what would have happened, the one person in the story that I feel terribly sorry for is the foreman, wondering what he would do the following day. Never mind conditions now, we know what would happen now, there'd have been a walkout straight away, there would have been an unofficial strike, which would probably have become official, and the owner of the vineyard would have been in an industrial tribunal pronto. But even then, try and imagine what would happen the next day when that owner went out to try and get workers to come into his vineyard. I can imagine that some would say, we are just not going to work for you. I can ima imagine others who would work for him but would slacken off straight away and say, he pays you, it doesn't matter how much work you do or how little. I can imagine still others saying, well, I'm not going to get out of bed till five o'clock and then I'm going down to the marketplace and he's really a dead winner. You can get in at five o'clock and get a full day's wage. And I can imagine a few, very few, and it, I need to stretch my imagination, who might say, well, he was so good to us yesterday, we'll go and work the whole day for him free today. But as a recipe for industrial relationships, it is a recipe for disaster. And this is like so many parables of Jesus. They seem to be going along normal tracks until a certain point, and then there is a twist and something happens which is quite untrue to life. And it's where the twist comes that the real message of the parable comes. Most of this parable is strictly true to life. 
Now I know that we have to make a culture jump to understand the story. I've never worked in a vineyard, for example. Uh, and we've got to think ourselves into a situation in which men can only get a job day by day and only get 24 hours employment at a time. We've got to think of a marketplace as a kind of labor exchange where they wait with their tools to be hired. We've got to think of working a 12-hour day and we've got to think of a return for a 12-hour day of approximately 50 pence in our money but then that was a normal daily wage then, even for a soldier in the Roman army. But even so, it is easy for us to get into the story. It's a straightforward story. It's true to life. And for those listening to it originally, until Jesus got halfway through, they would say, so what's new? What's he talking about? This is just something that happens every day. It's true to life. It's ordinary. Nothing special about this story. And then by the point that we call verse 9, eyebrows would begin to rise. The first funny little twist that is very untrue to life is simply that the owner decided to make those who'd worked for 12 hours wait at the back of the queue for their wages. Now something's beginning to go a bit wrong at that point. Surely, those who'd worked all day in the heat of the day should be able to come to the pay office window first and get their envelope first. But no, they're sent to the back of the queue. A funny owner this. He's already treading on corns. Then comes the shock of the story. They see the first people get a full day's wage, so they rub their hands at the bonus there will be in their own packet and are astonished that they get no more. Now that's the point at which the story becomes shocking. Many parables are like scorpions. They have a sting in the tail and they really are stinging. In fact, it's a story with a very unhappy ending. Relationships just break up. The relationship between the employer and employees has broken down altogether. And what the relationships were between those who came at five o'clock and those who'd been working since six in the morning were, as they went home, I don't know, I shouldn't think they were speaking to each other. The whole thing seems to break up. And yet Jesus said, that is what the kingdom of heaven is like. So we're going to have to put on our thinking caps tonight and get down to looking at this story. Now, somebody has said that this story of Jesus is the second most difficult parable to interpret of all those that Jesus told. The most difficult one is the story in Luke 16 about the unjust steward where our Lord apparently praises a criminal and tells us to behave as a common crook does. But this is the second most difficult and a lot of ink has been spilled trying to say what the real message of Jesus was. And I'm going to give you a number of the interpretations. I'm going to tell you which ones I think are wrong and why. But I want you to realize that we're not handling an easy passage. Is Jesus commenting on industrial relationships, on work and wages? Is there something in here for our contemporary situation? Or is it something more subtle than that? Let's put the question another way. Is this one of those stories that he told to lift people up, to encourage them, to invite them to something that they would respond to positively? Or is it one of those stories that he is using as a fairly sharp weapon to cut them down, to challenge them, to admonish them, to warn them? Our Lord could have a very sharp tongue at times. Now you'll find that most of his parables can be put in one or other basket. They're either stories that lift you up and encourage you, like that story of the man who found treasure in a field and so he hurriedly covered it over with soil and he ran off and he bought the field and he got the treasure with it and got a real bargain. And you respond fairly positively to that story, do you? Or do you? I don't know. <laughs> You're shaking your head. But it's one of those stories that encourages you to look for something worth looking for. The pearl of great price is another. But there are other stories that have a really deadly warning hidden in them somewhere. Now which is this? 
Most of the wrong interpretations of the story, I think, come because people believe that Jesus was telling a story here to encourage us, to fill us with hope, telling a story that had a simple moral in it that would invite us and encourage us in some way. And so they say, the essential piece of good news in this story is that everybody finishes up with the same. And they fasten on the wages as the key point. Now that's all very well, but here we get into a real pickle, and I'm sorry, but for the next ten minutes, no, five minutes, I'm going to confuse you by telling you what kind of a muddle you get into if you believe that that's what Jesus is doing. If he's saying in some way we shall all finish up in heaven with exactly the same and that that's the message, then you've got some very awkward questions to ask. The first question you've got to ask is what exactly is the thing we finish up with? What does the coin stand for? And some of the Christians through the centuries have said the coin is the gift of salvation which we all have and which we all get and it's the same for everybody. Now that sounds all right until you ask, well look, some of them really had to work a long time for it and some of them worked a little time for it and they all worked for some of it and I thought salvation was something you didn't work for at all. I thought it was free. And so people back off that explanation and they go for a much more common one and say this is a story about the rewards waiting in heaven for service rendered on earth and we are all going to receive the same reward in heaven however much we have done or however little. Now that is the most common interpretation of this parable that is given and it is contrary to so many other scriptures where it says that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ and that he will reward us according to our fidelity in our service. But those who take the parable this way have then to ask this funny question, what do the different times of starting work signify in Christian service? Now here we get very involved. On the one hand are some scholars who say that it means that the people who started serving Christ in the first century and the people who started serving Christ in the 20th century and the people who started serving Christ in the 15th century will all get the same reward. That's a funny kind of interpretation. A more common one appeals to a lot more people, namely that it doesn't matter whether you started serving the Lord at 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 or 90 years of age if you are faithful in service God will reward your fidelity. Now there's an element of truth in that interpretation but I don't believe it's what Jesus is saying here. It also runs into difficulties. In fact the people who interpret the story this way have so scratched their heads that they've had to come up with the extraordinary th belief that there's something missing from the story and that our copy of it has a vital fact missed out as if you borrowed a detective novel from the library and found the last three pages missing and the vital thing that some say has been missed out is the simple fact that the people who worked for 12 hours worked very slowly and the people who worked for one hour worked so quickly that they did as much as the others and so it was all fair and it was all right. Well why doesn't it say so? It's interesting that the Jews had a story very like this and at the same time as Jesus taught this story a Jewish rabbi taught a very similar story about a king who called men to work in his vineyard and after they'd been working two hours he called a man out of the vineyard and for the rest of the day the king and this man spent the time walking through the vineyard talking and at the end of the day he paid this man the same wage as the others and the others complained and the king said ah but this man did as much in two hours as you all have done in twelve hours now that's the Jewish version of the story and there's no problem with that 
but what a trite story. No, we haven't got anywhere near what Jesus is really saying here yet. And I'll tell you why. If you interpret this story either as the gift of salvation to us or the rewards for service in the kingdom, then you cannot really do justice to the end of the story. The story could stop three verses from the end and you would still have the whole story. You see, the story doesn't finish up in heaven. If this is what heaven's going to be like, everybody arguing about what the rewards have received, then I don't want to go there. If this is a prophecy of the day when the rewards will be given to us, then there's going to be an awful lot of grumbling in heaven. No, it's not going to fit. Somehow we've got to come to terms with the fact that Jesus finished this story on a very earthy note. In the kind of grumbling, in the kind of arguing, in the kind of grabbing and struggling, in the very kind of thing you are reading in your newspapers and seeing on your television screens during this first part of 1979. This is not a picture of heaven, this is a picture of something that we're all too familiar with on earth. It is a picture of attitudes which, if we're honest, we have in our very own hearts. And so we've got to come at this story from a very different angle. Instead of seeing it as one of those stories Jesus was giving us to encourage us, Let's ask, was he giving a warning in this story? Was he admonishing us? Was he rebuking us? Was he exposing something about the fallen human nature that would spoil heaven if it got there? Is he taking the light of heaven to show up the darkness of earth? For you see, for Jesus, the kingdom of heaven wasn't just something in the future that we're going to enter one day. For Jesus, the kingdom of heaven had broken in now. It was here and now. Repent and believe the kingdom of God is here. It's come. The new order is breaking in and therefore it's coming into collision with the old order. The new attitudes have broken through and are now challenging the old attitudes. The new outlook has broken in and now exposes the old outlook. That's what's happening. Indeed, in this simple story, Jesus is showing a confrontation between two totally different outlooks as far apart as heaven is from earth, and yet they are meeting in the very people to whom he is telling the story. And this is our situation, and it's the one in which we may be caught up in our conversation at least during this next week, if not in our actual conduct because it's the very situation which our newspapers are painting. And the question is, is our attitude going to be the old earthly attitude or the new heavenly one to as basic a question as work and wages? Well, now having said that, let's look at the story as a warning. It begins to make sense to me now it exposes my honest and natural reactions. Because there's something in this story that we don't like. Now most of Jesus' stories, or many of them, we love. Oh, tell us the story of the lost sheep and the lost coin. Time and time again, we love it. Even the prodigal son we love. Though I'm going to show in a moment that it's very much the same as this one. We love some of the stories of Jesus, but if you ask people which is their favorite parable, I would think they would not choose this one. There's something in it we don't like. And I'll tell you what it is. There is a feeling that the owner of the vineyard was less than fair. Less than fair. And we are born with an inbuilt sense of injustice. Have you noticed that you never need to teach a child to sense injustice? Have you noticed that? He got a bigger piece than I did. You never have to teach a child to say that. My mother used to say what many others said, if you want to cut an apple exactly in halves, let one child cut it and the other have first pick. And you get it exactly halved. <laughs> we are born 
with a nature that never needs to be taught to say three words it's not fair and it's one of the most common phrases on children's lips as we grow up we dress it up in sophisticated language and listening to the words of some of the leaders of the strikes and the trade union officials though they dress it up in all kinds of language what they are saying is it's not fair that the drivers of high-speed passenger trains should get more than the driver of an old-fashioned train it's not fair and this is the cry of the human heart that readily comes to our lips it's not fair and this is our reaction to this story there's something in it that's not fair and we sense an injustice it is not fair that a man who's worked 12 long hours and especially in the Middle East heat of noon that he should get the same wage as a man who's only worked one hour in the cool of the evening it's just not fair and there's something in us rebels against the story now have you ever stopped to think what that feeling of it's not fair actually does to you have you ever tried to analyze what's happening to you when you say it let me just spell it out first it's making you self-centered because we nearly always say it's not fair about our own circumstances we don't often say it about other people's have you noticed that we feel it when we are being treated unjustly much more strongly than when someone else is so it's essentially a self-centered feeling you have to have matured in character when you can be more angry at someone else suffering injustice than you it shows a remarkable maturity of character when that's where your anger arises there's another thing about saying it's not fair have you noticed what it does to your emotions and through them what it can do to your health but there are all kinds of unhealthy emotions associated with this phrase it's not fair there is anger there is bitterness there is resentment there is envy and these emotions are bad for us even physically a person who stays living in those emotions will sooner or later suffer bad health there is something even worse about this feeling of it's not fair and it's this it leads us to make calculated comparisons with other people which destroy our love for them and introduce hate for them you see it's not just that I'm being treated unjustly I may even be treated justly but if someone else is getting more than they deserve even if I'm getting what I do deserve then hatred is born within my heart for him he becomes my enemy and this whole thing of it's not fair if we're going to go through life saying it's not fair we shall finish up a self-centered envious person with a seed of hatred in our hearts there is an attitude that is poisonous and it is part of our fallen human nature that we are so ready to spring with those words on our lips it's not fair it's not fair now it is that attitude which Jesus is challenging in this story it is the attitude of saying what is it there in this for me and the attitude that looks at the neighbor and says and what's he getting too that attitude is being challenged here it's not just asking the question are we getting all we deserve but are they getting more than they deserve and when you listen carefully to the debates that are going on I've mentioned the trains let me mention the truck drivers wages for truck drivers are settled regionally so each region is listening to what the next region is getting are they getting more than we're getting that's the mood that's the atmosphere that's the conversation that's the earth the world in which we are having to live and Jesus is saying is that your attitude then the kingdom of heaven is not like that 
So now let's look at the story from a different point of view. We've been taking the side of the workers, but let's look at the owner and let's see it from his point of view. And we find out that instead of the story being the story of a man who is less than fair, it is the story of a man who is more than fair. What a difference that is. This is not less than fair, it is more than fair. Here is a man who is going beyond what he needs to do. Here is a man whose concern is primarily for others, not himself. Here is a man who gives the impression to me as I read the story that he's doing favors for people all the way through the story. He is doing a favor in giving them work in the first place. All right, he needs workers in the vineyard, but I get the strong impression, don't you, as you read on, that when he finds people who haven't got work, that he creates jobs for them, that he wants them to have the opportunity to work, that he is giving them work. He's a man who is trying to help them, not just to help himself. He wants to help them. And when it comes to giving out the wages, here's a man who looks at the worker and says, what does he need? And what does his family need? Because that wage was a subsistence wage. You couldn't save anything out of it. You could only just keep your family going on it. And a day out of work was a disaster. And this man, this owner of the vineyard, looks at these workers and he thinks of their wives and their children. And he knows that if he only pays them one hour's wage, those families will go hungry. Here is a man who is doing more than justice. He is showing mercy. Mercy is not less than fair, it is more than fair. Now, if you belong to the kingdom of earth and have a worldly attitude, you'll say of this man, he is less than fair. But if you step into the kingdom of heaven and look at this man again, you'll say, he's more than fair. Now, when the bad feelings entered the situation and it broke up and the relationship soured, this owner is able to say, the cause of the bad relationships is not in my action, but in your attitude. It's not me who's doing wrong, it's you who are doing wrong. Are you envious because I am generous? Are you telling me that generosity is bad? I tell you that envy is the bad thing. Now that's the story. It's not someone doing something that is less than fair, but someone who is more than fair. It is not a story about justice, it is a story about mercy. And it is saying that heaven operates on a different principle to earth. If I can put it in a sentence, and I'll come back to it just before I close. God operates not on what a man deserves to get, but on what he delights to give. That's the kingdom of heaven. And I just want to say hallelujah that it is. Thank God that heaven is not a meritocracy. That's a big word. But you live in one, so you might as well get to know the word. This whole world is a meritocracy. Whether it's capitalist, west, communist, east or third. Every part of our world is a meritocracy, a world in which you get what you go for, a world in which you grab, a world in which you have to look after number one because nobody else will, a world in which you have to struggle and strive, a world in which you get what you deserve, a world in which you have to work and earn for what you get. That's a meritocracy and Jesus is saying the kingdom of heaven is not a meritocracy. One of the greatest dangers is that you come in to the kingdom of heaven and bring with you this concept of merit which must be left behind at the door. Almost every religion in the world, I think I could say every religion in the world apart from the religion of Jesus, sooner or later has become a religion of merit. If you do this, then God will give you a place in heaven. I read a, one rabbi who actually listed the number of good works, I think it was just over 3,500, which he reckoned you must do good deeds in one lifetime to be sure of a place in heaven. 
Now that's a caricature. But when you study religion, you will find that if you boil it down, religion is saying, you say your prayers, you fast, you give to the poor, you do this, you do that, and you'll make it. And Jesus comes with this revolutionary concept. The kingdom of heaven is not built on merit. It is built on mercy. And the God who owns the vineyard is a God who treats you not as you deserve, but as he delights. That's the picture of God right through the Bible, but I just turned up Romans chapter 9 and read a remarkable little verse 2 there. Just listen to this. Shall we say then that God is unjust? Not at all. For he said to Moses, I will have mercy on anyone I wish. I will take pity on anyone I wish. So then everything depends not on what man wants or does, but only on God's mercy. And the only people who will object to that are the people who still have pride in their heart. For behind the grumblers in the story doesn't lie greed. They would have been perfectly content with their wage. It was pride that was hurt. Now let's ask, when did Jesus tell this story? To whom was he speaking? And here comes the awful shock. He was not speaking to crafty businessmen. He was not speaking to angry workers on strike. He said this to his own disciples. Not even to the crowd, but to those who had left everything and followed him and devoted their lives to him, who'd already spent two and a half years with him. And he said this story to them, to Peter and James and John. And he said, I want you to hear this story. Now, why should he say it to his own followers? I'll tell you why. Because though they had left their business to follow Jesus, their business had not left them. They had not left this calculating comparison behind when they followed Jesus. Do you know what happened just before this story was told? A very rich young man came to Jesus and said, Jesus, I want eternal life. What do I do? And Jesus said, well, have you been trying the commandments? He said, yes, I've tried them. I've kept them all. It hasn't got me anywhere. And Jesus said, I'll tell you what you need to do. Get rid of all your money and, and you come and let me run your life and you'll find it. And the man's jaw dropped and he looked very unhappy and he turned around and he walked away. And as he walked away, Peter said to Jesus, we were ready to take the step. We left everything for you. What's in it for us? He actually said that. What shall we get? Because we left everything. And Jesus was so patient and so tender with his disciples. He didn't crush Peter immediately. He didn't slap him in the face for thinking such a thought. He said, Peter, you don't need to worry about reward. Anybody who's given up anything for me will be repaid a hundredfold. But Peter, you shouldn't have asked that question. You should be very worried if you're still thinking like that. Peter, is our relationship just that of an employer and an employee? Are you simply my hireling? Are you in it for what you get out of it? Peter, the kingdom of heaven is like an owner of a vineyard. And then he told the story. And so it was Peter, thank God for Peter, because he always blurted out his thoughts. We should be very grateful to Peter for that, because we would have just thought it. You know the cynical saying, where there's a will, there's relatives. Well, I'll tell you, <laughs> I'll tell you what lies behind that saying. Situation after situation has arisen when a person has died and the will is read, though the people receiving benefit from the will have done nothing to deserve what they get. If she's got more than I have and if he's got more than I think he should have and the family breaks up. There have been families that have broken up immediately after a funeral never to get together again. Because even though they didn't deserve anything, somebody got more than someone else. 
we're dealing here with basic human nature. And even Peter, after two and a half years, said it. We gave up everything. What will we have? How much will we get? And Jesus said, you'll get a hundredfold, but forget it. The kingdom of heaven isn't like that. And if you're serving and following me in order to merit a reward, then you haven't understood the kingdom of heaven yet. And what happened immediately after he told his story, shall I tell you? James and John went to their mother and said, Mum, would you go to Jesus and put in a good word for us and try and get us the chief seats in the kingdom on the right and the left hand side of Jesus? And the mother came and said, Jesus, I, I wonder if you'd do something for my two boys. They've been with you right from the beginning. You called them first, you know, and, and I'd like you to give them the chief seats. And Jesus didn't answer the mother. He knew where it had come from. He said, James and John, can you afford to pay the price to be with me? Can you suffer? They said, yes, we can. Well, he said, it's not for me to give those seats. My father will deal them out. And then it says the other ten disciples were angry with James and John for trying to get ahead of them. The other ten were angry because they were trying to get an advantage, trying to get the first rise. And you can see that, in fact, still after two and a half years, all the twelve disciples were still infected with the concept of merit and they still hadn't understood that God in heaven is never less than fair, he's always more than fair. That is the meaning of the story. And depending on whether you've really grasped the concept of the kingdom of heaven will depend your reaction to this story, you'll either hate it or love it. If you're still thinking in terms of merit, you will say that's less than fair. If you have got onto the realm of mercy, you'll say it's more than fair. It's mercy. Well, that's my understanding of the story. And if the three closest disciples of Jesus, Peter, James and John, failed at that point, then I need to listen to this warning too. Jesus is saying, don't let the world around you press you into its own mold. All around you hear merit, merit, merit. We teach our kids this with our emphasis on examinations. You get what you deserve. It's all merit, merit, merit. Mercy seems an alien concept in the jungle in which we live. But that's the message. The story is not a solution to industrial problems on earth. It's a sample of the industrial principles of heaven. Service for the Lord is so different. The clash between the shop steward and the owner in this story is nothing else than the contrast between heaven and earth. Have you ever noticed that when John the Baptist was preparing the way for the kingdom, when John the Baptist wearing those simple clothes out in the wilderness by the river Jordan was saying, repent and believe the kingdom's coming, have you noticed that when people came to be baptized, he asked them this question, are you content with your wages? That's pretty real. It's down to earth. But he would not baptize someone who was not content with their wages. He had understood the kingdom. Let me just summarize. Merit and the very concept of merit can spoil Christian service. The calculating approach that serves the Lord with one eye on the reward that will come will lead to wrong attitudes and broken relationships. It will lead you to begrudge a brother his extra blessing that the Lord in his mercy has given or the gifts that the Lord in his mercy has given another which he did not deserve or the opportunities another is getting that he did not deserve. You will begrudge it. You will also be led to make that calculating comparison that despises someone else's contribution and says, well, they only worked one hour, I worked twelve. All such thoughts would taint Christian service 
and would forfeit the reward so that in literal truth, as Jesus said, if you let merit into your thinking about service for the kingdom of heaven, you are in for a nasty shock. You will find that the last are first and the first are last. You will spoil what you're doing. That is not to say it is wrong to think of reward. Jesus spoke about rewards. He left us in no doubt that for certain things there are great rewards in heaven. But here he is saying those rewards are of grace as much as the work which earned them is given to you by grace. Not merit, but mercy. A very different world. If you are in the world of merit, then you talk of the rights of the worker. If you are in the world of mercy, you talk of the rights of the owner. And that's why the owner of the vineyard says, Am I not within my rights to do what I want with my money? And God is within his rights to have mercy on whom he will have mercy. He is within his rights to give us more than we deserve. He is within his rights to give gifts to one and opportunities to another. He is within his rights because he lives in a world of mercy and not a world of merit. And we have no rights in a world of mercy. We have to come to a God. And if God calls you or me into his service, that is his mercy. I have no right to be a servant of the Lord. And if he rewards me for what I do, that's mercy. I have no right to expect it. But God is more than just and loves to be merciful. What a lovely message. Could anyone wish to work for a better boss? What then does he expect of us in our relationships with each other? The answer, interestingly enough, was given centuries before this story was told by the prophet Micah. He said, what does the Lord require of you but this? To do justly, that is the absolute minimum. We must be at least fair to do justly, but that's not all. To love mercy. To love to give what people don't deserve. To love to go the second mile. To love to be generous. And that's not enough too. Because you could fall into the trap of thinking that loving mercy puts you high up the list. And to walk humbly with your God. Justice is the minimum. On that we build mercy. But lest that go to our heads and turn into merit. To walk humbly with our God. Father, I would just thank you for the privilege of being able to preach tonight. I don't deserve it, but I thank you for it. And on behalf of all those in your service, in this congregation, who are working for you, we thank you for inviting us into the kingdom of heaven to work in the vineyard. We thank you that you will never allow yourself to be in our debt. Oh, it is mercy all, immense and free. For, oh my God, it found out me. Amen.